Right, well, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, microbiology and the effects it has on, on cooling, etc. Um, so, there are basically uh, three um, concerns in the water treatment industry. One is corrosion, one is biofouling, and one is deposition. Scaling being part of the deposition. And these three legs are inextricably connected, okay? So if you have corrosion, if you have biofiling, you will get corrosion, you will get deposition, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, for instance, if you have biofouling, you have products of metabolism um, of the bacteria, which will lead to corrosion. If you have biofouling, you've got particle entrapment, which will lead to deposition. And uh, this deposition in, in itself will then um, uh, turn into under deposit corrosion because of the, um, the bacterial um, met met metabolites and so you can see that these are all connected in both ways biofouling I've just got some photos of biofouling here these are all <coughs> on chiller units condenser units um, There you can see some fouling there. Goeie Afrikaans word is snot. It looks like snot. Okay. The impact of biofouling. Um, biofouling impacts corrosion and deposit control. It blocks corrosion inhibitors, which we add to the water in order to, to prevent corrosion. It traps non-biological foulants. In other words, any dust that gets sucked into the cooling system gets trapped in this uh, biofouled uh, mess around your, your system. It creates concentration cells. Now, a concentration cell is where you get a difference between um, a concentration difference between different kinds of salts in your system, and that can or that will lead to, to corrosion taking place. So it also does concentrate your corrosive products, um, which is the metabolite of the bacteria. The impact of this is it reduces heat transfer. We'll get to that a bit later. I can show you exactly how that, why the impact is like that. Increased corrosion rates because of um, the water with the treatment chemicals not actually reaching the, 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 su the substrate. Um, reduced water flow. Block tubes, higher operating costs, I think this is where Kevin comes in, um, higher maintenance costs, reduced equipment life, and reduced or lost production. Sources of contamination are the following, organisms and nutrients. They come from the makeup water, process leaks, and the atmosphere. Because these cooling towers are constantly scrubbing air, it constantly scrubs it in, and you have a uh, continuous growth uh, of, um, of uh, organisms coming through, through the air. Your makeup water itself, if that is not from a good uh, source, you will have a problem there. And then process leaks as well, because of corrosion, uh, could also lead to your organisms um, uh, getting more and more and more in your system, as well as feeding them with all the extra nutrients that they give them. Factors favoring growth, the water itself, the temperature of the water. Um, at the different temperature levels, you get different types of bacteria. You get psychophiles. Those are bacteria that run uh, or that can grow very well at uh, low temperatures. Mesophiles, which are the normal temperatures, 25 to 38 approximately, and your thermophiles, which are bacteria that can um, reproduce at relatively high temperatures. pH range also uh, plays a big role in uh, the growth of these bacteria, and then obviously the nutrients that are involved in the, in the water. Sources of energy are carbon and nitrogen. Common microbes grow in the pH range of 5 to 9. This is the normal type of water that we introduce into our plants um, and that we have to adapt in order to get to the correct pH to get the best uh, efficacy of the uh, biocides that we introduce. 
fungi grow best at pH 5 to 6, bacteria at 6.5 to 7.5, algae at 7.5 to 8. Nutrients are energy from organic and inorganic compounds, uh, which get introduced via many streams. Carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus uh, are also used for building of new cells. So if you have a lot of that in your system, you will definitely have a problem microbiologically. Microorganisms exist in two states, planktonic and sessile. Planktonic is free-floating in bulk water. In other words, if you take a sample of water and you have that analyzed, you will only analyze for planktonic uh, bacteria. And then you have your sessile bacteria, which are attached to the surfaces. So these are the ones that we really need to, to take care of, because underneath this uh, sessile bacteria um, layer, that's where your corrosion, etc., would start taking place. So it could be the same organisms, but in different states. Sorry, did you say, if you take samples, do you take one or both? No, normally when you take samples, it's basically just the water running through your system that gives you a very good idea of what your bacterial loading is, if you have it analyzed. Um, and because the same organism can be in both states, either plaquenotic or sessile, it'll give you a very good indication of where you are. <coughs> just these are just pictures of um, scanning electron microscope, photos of microbial slime deposits, biofilm with um, uh, photosynthesizing product, uh, bacteria in it. And this is what I was referring to just now when I spoke about the corrosion taking place underneath the biofilm. The part above this line, this rough little line there, that is your water phase. And that's where your planktonic organisms um, are most prevalent. Okay? Then, when you get your biofilm, or snotlog as we call it, um, you get different layers. You get an aerobic layer, which is the one closest to the water, water phase. Then you get your facultative layer, which is in between the two. And you get your anaerobic layer, which is the layer which is closest to the actual surface of your tubes or your... Or, um, Towerful, etc., etc. So, under anaerobic circumstances, um, you get a lot of these bacteria that form organic acids, and they can actually form H2S, which is uh, highly, which can become highly acidic, and then also uh, attack the surface metals. Um, so, the closer you get to your surface of the actual cooling system. Um, the more anaerobic the situation is, and the more corrosive the environment becomes. So this is just the thickness of the biofilm, and that's, that's what we have to get rid of the whole time. Reduction of heat transfer efficiency. Biofilms contain a high percentage of water. Now, water in itself has a very, very high heat capacity. Okay. Now, because of the biofilm forming, it has the, the, the capacity to absorb or less and less heat from the um, uh, heat for, uh, yeah, from the heat transfer system. Um, so it in itself forms an insulator. It uh, acts as a stagnant layer of water, and there you have your conductions. Um, taking place, but because it is a stagnant layer of water, conduction doesn't f take place very quickly, and it reduces your heat transfer capacity significantly. That's your um, free-flowing water. That's where the water just flows. There's no flow over that area because of the biofilm sitting there, so it doesn't take away the heat as well as quickly as possible. So there is a bit of a delta T over this, and uh, that is why Biofilms are definitely a no-no in any system. What is the red layer? The red layer is, is where the bacteria adhere to the system. Okay. Um, many times the top, sorry, many times the top layer, let me just go back there. Many times the top layer of the biofilm could be could be dead bacteria. Okay. 
um, but it's still stuck to the, the sub-layer, which is connected directly to your, um, to your metal system. So that is then, if, the, if there is a biocide in your system, it will kill it off, but it won't always slough the bacteria off your system. For that, you're going to need something else. So you could end up with a dead layer there, which, is, which has got a lot of water um, entrapped in it, and which uh, keeps it, it transfer. inhibits transfer of, of heat. Reduction of fluid throughput. Biofilms increase roughness of your area, and if the water has to flow over that, it will make little eddies everywhere, so it's going to, to decrease your water uh, flow uh, because of viscoelastic viscoelasticity. <laughs> um, it absorbs mechanical energy from the water, okay, and it increases the drag on the water as well. Okay. So the water flow will be less, you will have less, because of the less water flow, you will have less energy dissipation. Um, flow losses can exceed 10% for biofilms less than one centimeter thick. So if a biofilm is less than one centimeter thick, you can have a, a, a flow loss of up to 10%. Um, reductions in throughput are often greater than predicted by the reduction of tube inner diameter. I must, I, must I try and explain that. Um, if your tube is X, uh, is five millimeters or, or 10 millimeters um, in diameter, and you have a one millimeter uh, layer of slime in there, that means that your inner diameter is suddenly eight millimeters. Um, you can do a theoretical calculation on what the, the flow rate should then be. Um, but then, because of your viscoelasticity and the roughness, the flow rate will actually be even less than what the theoretical uh, calculation is. Okay. Microbiologically influenced corrosion, or induced corrosion sometimes as well. The microbes attach to surfaces and it creates concentration gradients on the surface of different salts. Okay? Different salts, different um, gases, different metabolites. Um, and then it also produces a, s a situation where colonized, oh, come on. colonized areas become anodic and uncolonized areas become cathodic. So that creates a concentration cell where you get electron exchange and that will then lead to, to corrosion in your system. It isolates surfaces from inhibitors. Um, all good water treatment uh, uh, regimens should have uh, a good, uh, the proper um, uh, corrosion and scale inhibitors. And it interferes with the development of the forms it's a little bit cut off at the bottom here. But there's normally, um, if you have the right um, inhibitors, you will get a form of inhibition on your, on, your metal, um, lay, on your metal surface. And these um, biofilms, they interfere with the formation of that, of that film. Um, Sorry. Yes. Is that a form of galvanic um, no, not for microbiologically induced, no. Um, I would say more it's because of the concentration gradients of acids, etc. Um, galvanic is more to do with different metals in your system connected via water and then obviously the higher salt, salt levels. Okay. Um, okay, so you get your slime layer, it produces corrosive products, That is just a, a little metal plate um, taken out of a system. That's what it looks like. And once it's been cleaned, you can see underneath there, it's been nicely eaten away. Okay. These are the, the, the main culprits uh, that are formed is uh, inorganic acids, sulfides, ferric chlorides, manganic chlorides, organic acids. Um, and they all form underneath this little layer that you see there, and that's what happens then at the end of the day. D 
Depolarization reactions accelerate corrosion rates, that is when the one becomes anodic and the other one becomes cathodic. Okay. That's not a very good photo, but um, it's been eaten away. It's a piece of a tube that's been eaten away. At the anode, you get oxidation of ferrous to ferric ions and removal of ferrous ions by precipitation of the sulfide ions. Okay, just a quick look at the microbial world itself and what it, um, what it means. You have visible particles. Um, and it's the smallest visible, visible particle we can see as people is about 50 micron. Then you get red blood corpuscles, which is at seven and a half. Um, colloids at one, egg albumin, etc., 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 et cetera. And then you get your bacteria, your different types of bacteria, cocky and rods. You can see they're very, very small. You get fungi, algae, and amoeba, which is quite a big, big bugger. So an amoeba is actually almost visible. Shapes of bacteria, you get cocky, you get bacillus, you get filaments. Vibrios, which is like a little squiggly thing, and then spirillum. And all of these you can actually find in the water that runs through cooling systems. Okay. Growth of microorganisms. Microorganisms grow or can increase in number extremely quickly. Um, this is the normal phase in which they, they run. They have a lag phase where you have one or two bacteria. Then you get your logarithmic phase where they just grow and grow and grow and grow. And then as, as long as there's enough nutrients and the temperature is correct, et cetera, et cetera, you get a, a logarithmic phase where the growth is just totally out of control. Then you get a stationary phase. That is where the nutrients become, uh, become less available. Um, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the colony might have grown so big that the center of the colony doesn't get any nutrients anymore, so it's dying out from the inside. So it's a stationary phase where you get a bit of growth, but you also get death. Okay? And then you get your decline phase, and that is where this colony will actually almost implode and, and die off. But before the decline takes place, you will, this will seed the water coming in again, and it will go through this whole situation again. So. This is the most dangerous part of the whole growth cycle of, of bacteria. Okay. This is just, a, uh, just to show how bacteria grow. You have cell, cell wall, cytoplasm. Um, the nucleus divides in two and then it uh, forms a little cross wall and voila, you've got two bacteria. Okay. So this is very, very simple. Um, there's no sex involved. Um, and then this is how quickly it can actually happen. This is a bacteria, about five, five bacterial cells. And in three and a half hours, we can have 640. Okay? Um, so this is a situation where the population doubles every 30 minutes. Five bacterial go over 600 cells in three and a half hours. But the next one is a better um, indicator. The time for bacteria to double can be as low as 20 minutes. So in other words, if you have two bacteria in 20 minutes, they give me four. And in 20 minutes, they can be eight. And this is the effect of that. Um, it means that within 24 hours, this is the amount of bacteria that could be in that sample or in that water situation. Luckily, the, this is absolutely under ideal conditions. Um, normally, it won't be as bad as this, but under the ideal conditions, it can. So just be very careful of that, or very aware of that. Not ideal for us, ideal for the bacteria. It's, a, it's ideal for the bacteria, yeah. yeah. Okay. 4.7 times 10 to the 21st. OK, endospore formation. Um, this is another problem that we face, and that is that 
the bacteria, once they die off, a lot of them form endospores. Now that is a, um, it's almost like a little egg, uh, for lack of a better word, um, that doesn't die. It just lies there and it just waits for ideal conditions to, to erupt again and then suddenly you have a, a re-in reinfection of, of your system. Um, the parent cell will disintegrate, you have your free endospore, and that can go anywhere and sit somewhere, and if it doesn't get killed off, it germinates again, and you have this whole problem right from the start. Yeah. Okay, bacteria itself, common biofiling organisms, can grow throughout the cooling system, doesn't matter where, high flow, low flow areas, extreme nutritional versatility, they can basically eat anything or, or metabolize anything. You get heterotrophs, they eat basically anything. You get autotrophs, they are specific um, uh, nutrients. Aerobes need um, oxygen uh, for them to grow. That's aerobes, and then you get your anaerobes. Anaerobes are the ones that are normally closer to your metal surface underneath the slime layer um, that I've shown to you just now. Um, and those are the ones that you really want to keep out of your system because as soon as you can get into anaerobic conditions in your system, then you have problems. Your pH will be a problem. It'll, it'll be very difficult to, to maintain um, cleanliness. Okay, filamentous bacteria. Just some photos of that. Um, sulfur bacteria. That's also what you don't want, SRBs, sulfur-reducing bacteria. There you go. Anaerobic bacteria that reduce SO4 to H2S. Okay, H2S is the forerunner of sulfuric acid. So that's the one you really don't want in your system. Um, once you do have sulfate-reducing bacteria in your system, you have a problem. It's not easy to get rid of. Um, you will basically have to clean your whole system out, et cetera, et cetera. So um, you will then also have to be to use um, quite aggressive type of biocide to do that. There you go, SO32 minus. Sorry, this is just it's often associated with microbiolo microbiologically induced corrosion. Okay. There you can see some photos of um, slides that have been eaten away by sulfate-reducing bacteria. And that doesn't take long. It doesn't take long for it to become like that. Denitrification is another um, problem, but this is more uh, in closed chilled systems where we use nitrite to uh, inhibit corrosion. Um, where you get denitrification or denitrifying bacteria, and they actually live on the product that we introduce um, to inhibit corrosion. Heterotrophic they can also grow under limited oxygen conditions. They're actually aerobic, but under limited oxygen, they can also live. Um, they use oxygen as electron acceptor for respiration, and when conditions become anaerobic, they reduce. NO3 or NO2 instead of oxygen. So nitrate or nitrite, they reduce that as a nutrient for themselves. And these are just the types of bacteria that can do that. Um, in nitrite closed, treated closed systems with, with significant microbiological contamination, denitrification will occur. In nitrite treated closed systems, which is quite um, prevalent in air conditioning, with significant microbial contamination, denitrification will occur. Then we get to Legionella, which is um, a big word uh, for flu like symptoms that you can get. Sometimes people have it for a day and they carry on. You get different strains of Legionella, um, but you also get the type that actually can kill people. Um, I know that in the industry, the buildings industry, um, it's a very big um, 
every six months it has to be tested, etc., etc. Um, so yeah, that's I just want to run through that. It's motile. Sorry about that again. That the, that's cut off. Motile, which means that it can actually move around. Um, and it's a very widespread aquatic organism. Um, you get it in surface water. You get it. You can basically get it anywhere. And normally, protozoa can be the harbor host. In other words, if you have a small little worm creeping around in there, 10 to 1, there will be some Legionella bacteria in that. Okay. Um, many years ago, there was a, um, uh, what do you call it, um, a conference, I think, in, in Canada somewhere. I can't remember the exact details. Uh, but these people were all staying in a hotel. And um, obviously, they had a good conference. And then later on, a week or two later on, some people started getting ill, and some of them died. I think eight people died. Uh, it was very much like a, a flu-like um, pneumonia-type um, outbreak. And then they, they, they narrowed it down to this specific hotel. And they uh, did tests all over, and they found that the Legionella um, organisms were um, prevalent in the air conditioning systems. So the air conditioning system blows cool air in, which obviously also contains some uh, very, very fine droplets. Uh, people breathe that into their lungs and they become sick. So any, any cooling tower, if a cooling tower is infected with Legionella and you're working around that cooling tower, um, I'm not saying you're going to get Legionella because the cooling tower always has a bit of splash around it, always has a bit of water escaping, and you will breathe that in. Um, I've been working in the industry for 20 years. I have never had Legionella. Um, and I've worked around some cooling tiles which were very shoddy. Um, but it's something that you must keep in mind. And um, if you do run a building air conditioner, um, please be aware that this can be, it can come back and bite you if you don't have uh, all your ducks in a row with this. Okay. For Legionella, it's just good housekeeping. Okay. Um, and also testing. I was involved with um, a casino where we tested the water, and we, we tested the water in all the cooling systems. We even went as far as testing the water in the rooms. Um, hot, hot water, cold water, hot water coming from the geysers. Um, and on one spot, we found a Legionella um, sample that tested positive. Um, we then had to isolate that system and then run it through with very high chlorine levels. That is, that is, that is the, the best way of cleaning it, but, or, or, or killing, killing it, very high chlorine levels are very bad for cooling systems, for met the metallurgies around it, etc. cetera. So, um, yeah, it's best not to have it. It's best to have a good um, water treatment regimen in place so that you don't run into this kind of problem. Okay. And then obviously, this test that we did at this casino, I think at that stage was about seven, eight years ago, it cost about 120,000 rand. So it's not an easy, it's, it's, it's relatively easy, but it's not a, it's not a very, uh, it's an expensive test to, to run through. Okay. Bacterial slime, we all know that very well. In the slime, obviously, you get inert materials that get entrapped in it which can create more and more and more problems. Algae, chlorophyll based, it's relatively easy to get rid of. Um, normally, if you have a cooling tower in a building with little sunshine, this will not, should not be a problem. Um, also, normally, if you have a good water treatment regimen in place, uh, the, any splash that takes place if, if that is done correctly with the correct biocides, it should take care of, of your algae. Well, water, air, and sunlight. So that's what I'm saying. If you, have, if you reduce the sunlight, you will, uh, the problem will be minimized. Different types of algae. Okay, what algae does, or what any of these slime formers actually do, is they can block your distribution nozzle, nozzles in open deck towers, plug screens and exchanges, provide nutrients and habitat for other organisms to grow. Okay, so you 
can see these are inert material, algae growing there. Any kind of um, dust or particle that gets recirculated can get entrapped in the slime layer, um, and that will then just add to your slime layer getting thicker and thicker and thicker and, and stronger and stronger at the end of the day. Typical populations, aerobic bacteria, 10,000 to a million CFUs per mil, CFU is colony forming units, um, anaerobic 0 to 10 in open evaporative systems, okay? Fungi and yeasts should not be a problem. Okay, this is just as interest. The reason why we're saying it's not a guarantee parameter, this means that if you do have these kinds of populations, it doesn't mean that your system is out of control. Okay. It can quickly go out of control. If you have 10,000 CFUs per mole of bacteria in your water and you don't add any biocide or uh, the temperature goes up to a better temperature range for them to grow in, then you will have a problem. What I, my understanding is that if you've got an evaporative cooling system and some of the air that comes out of that process, if it's recirculated back into the tower or into the process, that has a closed loop, in other words, that it then enables that system to build up and build up and build up. So again, the air. Yeah, so if you've got a, a, an evaporative cooling process yeah, yeah, yeah. and if you have an air coming through that, the, that's gone through the process. It's gone out the top. It's gone out the top yeah. of the side. And uh, some of it is recirculated back into the same system. And that builds up, that enables that process to, to the, the algae to build up and build up. In other words, that they're like the Legionella, for example, was led, uh, led to believe that, uh, for example, if you've got in a ventilation system near the plant, we have mm -hmm. an inlet and outlet near the tower, that it's a closed loop that actually is part of the problem that pulls up in this organism. It can, yeah. it can, yeah. Especially if you've got a lot of drift. Yeah. Um, drift is where the, the cooling tower just pumps up a lot of uh, very fine dust or mist. Um, then you can run into that kind of problem. Um, SRBs, sulfate reducing bacteria should be zero. Okay, so it's a good idea to have that tested every now and again. Um, but if you have a very good clean system, you will not have slime layer. Um, SRBs grow under anaerobic conditions, which is at the bottom of the slime layer, so you should not have a problem with the SRBs. Treat cooling systems for two reasons. One is to enhance and keep the performance going, and the other one is for compliance. Compliance specifically as far as the Janela goes. Um, okay, this is not just microbiology and biocides. There is an interconnectivity between, between the, the two. Monitoring. There are a few ways of monitoring um, bacterial growth. One is by plate counts, where you take a sample, they bring it to a lab, they put it out on a little agar petri form or petri dish, and it takes you three, four, five days sometimes, and then um, it gives you an idea of how many colony forming units you have in that specific sample. And that can then be related back to the actual system that you have. The problem with that is it takes too long. Okay. Petri form, which is a on-the-spot um, test, uh, which you can do. You can take a sample, do it right there, but it also takes about two to three days for you to, to give you a, a good result. Um, it, it's not a lab type. Uh, it's more of a, an in-house uh, kind of um, test. Broth methods, um, which is one of the faster methods of, of um, telling you how, what the um, bacteria problem is in your system is where they take a sample of the water, they put into a specific broth um, of nutrients, put electrodes in it, and then they measure the, diff, the diff, diff, difference in um, electric conductivity as the bacteria grow. As the bacteria grows, the electrical conductivity should start getting better or more, um, and that will then give them an idea of what the uh, amount of bacteria in that 
sample is, and then they can relate that back to, to what to, uh, how many CFUs per mole it can be. Dip slides, it's basically the same as the Petri film. Um, take a slide, put it into the water, turn it into the little capsule where it keeps, leave it there for two or three days, and then it'll give you an idea of what um, the bacterial growth is. Um, biofilm monitoring, stainless steel coupons. Okay, you can put a stainless steel coupon into the system, uh, take it out once a week, see what it does, see what it looks like. If it's full of slime, then you know you've got a problem. <coughs> also, just make sure that if you do put in coupons, that you use um, plastic nuts and plastic bolts. Um, that's in order to keep it away from the metal as far as possible because otherwise it can actually be galvanic corrosion taking place. It depends on what kind of coupons you're putting in. Microbiological control. We can use oxidizing biocides. These are biocides that physically kill and disintegrate your bacteria. That's very simply put. It's indiscriminate, and then you get the non-oxidizing biocides, which are based on specific reactions that take place with your, uh, between the bacteria and the biocide. Um, you get enzyme poisons or inhibitors. Uh, every living organism has enzymes which facilitate um, life, and some of these non-oxidizing biocides, they interrupt the enzyme, or they, des they destroy the enzyme to such an extent that that part of the life cycle can't happen and your uh, bacteria will die. Protein inactivation, enzymes are proteins, so it's basically the same thing. Um, interference with protein synthesis, interference with DNA synthesis, and then cell membrane disruption, which means that the cell membrane is disrupted in such a way that excess water might flow in, creating the cell to burst. Um, it can actually close it off a little bit, which which means that no nutrients can actually enter the cell. So these are the different ways that non-oxidizing biocides work. And interference with photosynthesis, which is um, applicable to algae. Oxidizing biocides, um, not very good for use because they oxidize. If there is a metal in that system, uh, normally stainless steel doesn't go well with oxidizing biocides like chlorine. Um, it's a very harsh type of treatment. Chlorine gas, sodium hypochlorite, calcium hypochlorite, chlorine dioxide, halogen donors, which are, um, you get tablets, which are bromine chlorine tablets, activated bromides, hydrogen peroxide, paracetic acid, I think you've all smelled that one, it's quite a harsh smell, and ozone. Um, These three at the top here are normally the ones that we try to stay away from. Um, the reason being is that they are quite aggressive. Um, and you also need for these to, uh, the water to be in a specific pH band uh, to get the maximum uh, kill, kill effect. Okay. Chlorine dioxide is making huge inroads. Um, it's being used at a lot of plants uh, where I work as well. Um, but yeah, I still have my reservations about chlorine dioxide. Hydrogen peroxide, advantages is environmentally friendly, alternative to halogens, halogens being chlorine, bromine, etc. Um, it's got a short half life in the system, peroxide. Normally we do approximately 0.1 to 0.5%. Um, reaction products are oxygen and water. So if you have a system which is fouled with bacteria and you add uh, 0.5 percent peroxide to the system um, at the end of the day the peroxide will basically disappear uh, in inverted commas uh, because it forms oxygen uh, due to the oxidation uh, process and because it loses one oxygen um, it, the rest becomes water so it's H2O2 2 H2O2 becomes O2 plus 2 H2O2 whatever Okay, um, disadvantages is 
it can be, it's also quite a relatively aggressive product. Um, if it gets onto your hands, it can burn you, um, it will make your skin turn white. Uh, or, and uh, storage is also not so good. Handling, dosing, um, it's quite difficult to always know exactly what the volume of a system is in, or in order to get to the correct percentage dosing that you need. Okay. Um, and then it also decomposes quite a lot due to metal. Uh, contamination. Deactivated by enzymes and bacteria can become immune to it. Bacteria have a very uh, bad habit of getting immune to stuff that should kill it. <laughs> uh, that's why we, uh, we will get to the next um, slide or two. Uh, we uh, will be discussing the non-oxidizing biocides. Um, if you use non-oxidizing biocides in a system, it's very good just to change them around periodically because you get, uh, because of the dosing system, the dosing regimen of uh, non-oxidizing biocides, um, you get a, a drop in concentration and then the bacteria that, that survive that drop, they get more and more and more used to it so that you can bas you basically later on you have immune uh, bacteria then you need to put in a different one. Non-oxidizing, it's also got antimicrobial activity. It's biostatic, which means it's not biocidal. It basically keeps it, um, uh, the status quo. In other words, if there's a thousand there, there will still be a thousand there, but they will not be able to proliferate. Inhibition of activity, inhibition of growth, um, and then you have your minimum inhibitory concentration, which is normally calculated in parts per million, so you add you dose X parts per million of product, and you know you've basically um, covered this uh, MIC. Biocidal can also be, which means it reduces the viability of the, of the bacteria, can't reproduce, um, interferes with the cell membrane, it can, it can actually die of that because of the uh, meta metabolic processes being inhibited. Okay. Non-oxidizing biocides are metabolic inhibitors. They interrupt metabolic cycles. They are enzyme poisons. Um, they destroy protein structures. They irreversibly bind to active sites um, in the cell of the, uh, of the bacteria. And then you also have the surface active agents uh, which reduce permeability of the cell membrane or reduce or improve it. Uh, so it actually will kill the uh, bacteria. Um, makes undesirable compounds can enter the cell easier. Nutrients and intracellular materials escape. So the, uh, it leaches out of the bacteria and the bacteria actually dies of that as well. Non-oxidizing biocides, metabolic inhibitors are the MBT, um, though this will work well out everything. Isothiazolin, that is one of the most preferred um, biocides that we use, and glutaraldehyde. The glutaraldehyde has got a very strong smell to it. Um, if, it fall, if it gets onto your hands, you won't notice anything, but please wash your hands when this stuff gets onto there, um, because it's got a long-term effect. It will attack the cells in your, in your, on your skin, etc. So just wash your hands very well once you have worked with this and once it has um, come onto you. Uh, these are all the different types. So just act as agents. Quartz, quartz ammonium compounds, um, still used widely. Uh, some industries, like the wine industry, don't really want to use it anymore. Uh, the wine industry also doesn't use chlorine or any chlorine derivatives at the moment um, because of wetgeven, um, what's it? Um, legislation. legislation and, and a lot of uh, overseas um, uh, um, yeah, well, yeah, regulations. Uh, DGH. Then biocide enhancement. Physical methods. Best way to have a clean system is to actually have it clean, because then you don't need to add so much biocide. 
if you have a slime layer, you're going to have to add more biocide to get rid of that or to actually help you clean the system. Um, routine cleaning of tower basin to remove sludge. Sludge will continuously build up in a tower because of the dust being pulled in um, and running through the water. The water will encapsulate it, deposit it in your basin, and that you will have sludge formation in your basin. Once you have sludge formation in your basin, you get um, at the bottom anaerobic conditions. That's where SRBs can start, uh, and that's where you start getting problems. The reservoir for organisms, the tower basin, organic material creates a huge halogen demand, uh, but we're staying away from halogens as far as we can. Settled solids absorb surface active biocides. So the solids can actually absorb some of the biocides that we add to kill the bacteria. So the solids can reduce the um, eff effectiveness of your, of your, bio, your biocide. Um, it permits re-inoculation. So in other words, if you have solids floating around, it can be covered in bacteria. Part of it might be killed, another part might not, so it re-inoculates your system continuously. Um, and if you have all these things in place, you will reduce your biocide demand and you will reduce your cost. And that is that. Flight, flight. Uh, tell me just a question on oxygen. Um, would you say, say for instance, that you, you see a condenser then you have to shut down, do an annual shutdown, either evaporate or condenser or whatever system? Is it better to drain the whole system? Um, because it will never dry up during, during the shut off period. So there will always be water and oxygen and you will have corrosion. Or is it better to keep the water in there because then you have limited oxygen? What? If you, if you can clean a system like that out very well and you can put a fan on it to dry it, that will be the best way of doing it. The best way to okay. dry That will be the best way of doing it. Second best? Second best, if you want to store it wet, you will have to add extra chemicals to it in order to, um, to take out the, uh, the oxygen. Because if you just store it wet and there's no movement, uh, you have different metals uh, concerned here you will get into a situation where you can get, number one, galvanic corrosion, um, or you can actually get um, pitting corrosion taking place because of uh, concentration cells forming uh, with the oxygen. So um, if you want to store it wet, you will have to uh, put a preventative type of chemical in there as well. And uh, the, uh, I've seen a lot of um, these chlorinators and cooling towers and and it runs through the system of a shell and tube a condenser with copper in it. Um, no. Um, no, that's. Obviously, that's no. Why, why, why is it known? It's, it's because of the chlorine. The chlorine is uh, it's an oxidizing biocide, okay, and um, aggressive. Um, and it's, uh, it'll start um, corrosion uh, your system, especially if you have stainless steel in your system. We'll start creating that. Normally, I think what you're referring to is in the wine industry. Uh, you get a lot of guys that just take a chlorine floater into the cooling tower, but they only run for two months. So the effect that they get is very limited in two months' time. It might take them five or six or seven years for uh, part of the machinery to actually implode. Whereas in the buildings industry, those, con those clean towers run continuously, the, the, the units run continuously, the heat exchange um, ma machinery runs continuously, and uh, no, chlorine will, it's not the right. Not the right would thing. you encourage some extreme filtration, like sand filters or any other type? And does it, does it actually help to fight this? Sand, yeah. Um, side stream filtration, they're talking about 10% normally of your volume. Um, it will help get rid of the sludge that accumulates in your system, okay, which is a good thing. Um, as long as you also make sure that your, your sand filters are clean and in working order and that uh, there is no bacterial buildup in the, in, the, um, in the sand filter as well. So it can, it can be a very good thing to put in if it's managed correctly, but if it's not managed correctly, it can be 
Um, yeah, can we talk it off? Uh, sulfonic acid. Yeah. Um, to clean up plate heat exchangers. Yeah, but what is it fouled with? Uh, scale um, sludge. Um, sulfonic acid, I would say maybe 5%. 5% sulfonic acid, but then run it through for a while and then dump and yeah, rinse it properly, um, neutralize, make sure that everything is clean after that. Yeah. Um, it's not the nicest or not the best way of doing it, but um, for a quick clean, yeah, as long as, yeah, it's an inhibited acid, so it should be fine. So just another question, antifoam, does it does it do anything? Because I found after excessive dosing or something goes wrong with the auto dosing system and uh, too many, too much uh, uh, biocides in or something, and then it starts foaming. So you add anti foam. Does it is it is there a negative effect on the system? Because um, it helps with the heat transfer, but you don't really know what what it does downstream. Yeah, the only, okay, if, if I recall correctly, anti-foam, um, if you have a system which is foaming continuously, that means that at your pumps, you will get a um, degree of cavitation taking place, okay? Um, and this will affect your, your circulation rates, et cetera, et cetera. If you put um, the correct amount of anti-foam in it, it will take care of the, it will restore the, um, what do you call it, uh, the um, surface potential, okay? Because that's exactly what it does. Um, it just restores the, sur the surface, um, that word I just used. Um, the, yeah, the surface potential. It just, um, it just restores that to the normal level so that the water can flow through um, without hindrance so again. So there's no uh, negative effects? No. If you put the right dose in it, there will not be no negative effects.